broken blues Climb the fence, books and pens I can tell that we are gonna be friends Come all the way from California, Santa Monica, yeah? Uh, Los Angeles. Los Angeles, yeah. yeah. From PD Magazine, which is a public diplomacy magazine, that's what the PD stands for, which is um, an advocacy magazine, and you will explain more yeah. now. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. It's, uh, it, it's a great pleasure to be here. This is my uh, first trip to Europe, my first trip to, uh, to Germany in particular. I took uh, German in high school, so it's a good opportunity to use the remnants of the, uh, the knowledge of that. And uh, I do remember at least two very important phrases, Essen and Speisekarte, bitte. <laughs> so, uh, uh, like I said, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's, it's also a great pleasure to follow uh, Marta, uh, because what I'm going to talk about today is somewhat similar to what uh, she was talking about, although I'm coming at it from a somewhat different angle. Uh, I'm a working journalist. Uh, I'm a, uh, in addition to working at uh, PD Magazine, uh, I'm also a, an editor at KNX Radio, which is the uh, CBS Radio all news station in Los Angeles. And so, uh, but like Marta, I'm an optimist about the role of citizen journalists and the uh, sort of some of the evolution we're going through as journalists. So I want to talk a little bit about that today and uh, a little bit about the economics of journalism, maybe uh, talk about a couple of different uh, ideas and stuff about, uh, about the future of journalism, and specifically about cultures of collaboration. And what I, what I mean by that, or, or I, I think the, the general definition is, uh, in this case, in this context, is the sort of ad hoc arrangements that drive the economics of journalism. So we'll get into that in a little bit. David Brinkley, the uh, renowned US uh, presenter, is quoted as saying, the news is what I say it is. And I think what, what he was referring to, it may, may sound like an arrogant statement when taken at face value, but what he meant was that someone has to choose the new, which news to cover in a limited period of time or space, say a half hour of television, or a uh, certain number of column inches. And it's a reflection of the uh, subjectivity of news uh, in, ter in terms of different contexts. My cousin, Steve, has a, a company called Shelves the Slide, uh, which is in the business of optimizing home storage. If that company uh, goes global or becomes part of the Fortune 500, that's major news in our family. In the context of California or the world or, you know, Europe or America, it would barely cause a ripple. So you have to look at the context. Take Paris Hilton, please. I couldn't, I'm sorry, I couldn't, re, I couldn't resist including a slide of Paris Hilton in a presentation at a major international conference. Uh, Part of that was my own uh, mischievous uh, impulse. By any standard, her time in jail affected absolutely nothing but her criminal record. Yet while I was on duty at KNX, the uh, radio station where I work, we had calls from stations as far away as New Zealand for interviews. Uh, it was one of the most uh, tapped stories from around the world that we had ever had. So again, you, you know, it's, it's, it's just, a total subjectivity thing. We were one of the offenders. We covered the story to the hill. I mean, of course, it was local news for us, but uh, nevertheless, we, uh, we did cover it. So who makes the decision on which news to cover? Well, in the words of former President George W. Bush, it is the decider who makes that determination. So what is news and who is the decider? Well, I would argue that those questions are central to the future of journalism in a networked age, and that the decisions that we make as journalists and citizens about freedom of expression and about some of the policies uh, that we advocate are critical to the survival of the profession, to making journalism what, uh, uh, or are critical to the survival of uh, freedom of expression and what Secretary of State Hillary Clinton calls the freedom to connect. 
Uh, as journalists, we've done a pretty good job of chronicling how the world has changed, but have we really adapted to that world? Manuel Castells, the gentleman uh, you see here, and who I had the honor of taking a course with uh, not too long ago, uh, has argued that we live in a network society. And by that he means we live in a society where the key social structures and activities are organized around electronically processed information networks. He goes on to say that it's uh, not just about networks or social networks, because social networks have been very old forms of uh, social organization. But it's about social networks that are based on electronically based technologies. It's an important distinction. He makes a distinction between what he calls the global economy and the commonly uh, referred to terms of the international economy or the world economy. The, global econ the difference is that the global economy works as a unit in real time on a planetary scale. Uh, you don't have to uh, watch CNBC to understand how that works. All you have to do is open an account in Burbank, California, as I did, and withdraw money in Berlin, as I did this morning. And you're participating in the, uh, in the global economy. So what did the network society and the global economy have to do with journalism? I would argue that we as journalists have to look, start looking at the world as Castells does, because we deal in information and knowledge. And information itself is a form of capital. So how do we, how do we manage information and, uh, and go through the process of using those uh, microelectronic based technologies? Well, people don't necessarily get their news from centralized sources anymore. They aggregate it, they share it, they pass it around, and when possible, they act on it. They act less like an audience or a readership and more like a community. It's a community linked together just like the global economy by microelectronics, but it's a community nonetheless. It's a virtual community. People in a news community like to talk back. They like to help. Newspapers and radio stations have recognized this. And the, uh, the comment pages that show up uh, at the end of news sources now, I mean, before uh, you could write a letter to the editor of the New York Times and maybe it would be published. Now you can just uh, go into a, uh, a comment page and uh, add your comment to it. It's become very interactive. And there are a number of other ways in which uh, this interaction uh, can be seen. Wikinews, for example, uses volunteers from around the world to write an updated site. Gannett has, or, has inaugurated a pro-am concept that blends contributions from readers and viewers with reporting in its newspapers and on its television stations. Just to give you an example of that, I used to live in, in Florida, in southwest Florida, uh, in Fort Myers, where one of Gannett's newspapers is located, the news press, the one you see here. They had a, uh, they discovered that uh, people were being charged exorbitant fees for water and sewer connections. So they decided to investigate. They started with a very small item uh, in the newspaper saying, hey, we're investigating this. Have you seen any examples of, of this kind of thing? Well, the, the response was amazing. People just flooded uh, the, the newspaper with, uh, with evidence. And they got some professional engineers to look at it. And sure enough, there was some uh, skullduggery going on. Executive editor Kate Merrimont called it a whole different way of building a story. It's possible if the news press had just done a story on its own, it might have been a good story. But this was a potent example of, uh, of citizen participation. We also uh, see a lot of the citizen participation in the uh, uh, and the concept of community in the uprisings in Syria and Iran, when activists and citizens, often at the risk of their own lives, use the electronic tether that links together the network society to contribute video documenting their struggles. We live in a collaborative culture. Just as the core activities of the global economy work together in real time and are connected, by, are connected digitally, 
the core activities of information gathering also work together in real time, and they're connected uh, digitally. I would argue that what we're going through is what I would call the fourth wave of collaboration. And it differs from the other three because it involves the people who consume news as well as produce it. The first wave began with the invention of the telegraph. Uh, this technology, which uh, began the first wave of globalization, was significant for journalism because it enabled the creation of the wire service. Uh, Associated Press started as a uh, cooperative, and it actually began as a, uh, as a Pony Express service, uh, bringing news of the uh, Mexican War uh, from a point near Texas to Alabama, where it was transported by mail coach to uh, it, Virginia, and then it was telegraphed to New York. This gentleman, Moses Yale Beach, uh, enlisted a bunch of publishers of New York newspapers uh, in a cooperative venture to get all this news, and, and they were free to publish it. And it was a cooperative. They, it, it didn't cost them anything. Uh, and it was, uh, it kind of put them on an even playing, on a level playing field. And b a gentleman by the name of uh, Menahem Blondheim argues that Beach's decision to share news with rivals was neither altruistic nor cost driven. It recognized that nothing could compete with the telegraph for speed and all newspapers, rich or poor, would now be on a par. The second model of a wire service was Reuters. It differed from the Associated Press in its business model, which was client-based, and its focus on information that had an impact on financial markets. Uh, Paul Reuter followed the example of Charles Havas, who started a lithographic news service in Paris in the 1830s, and who offered targeted news services to bankers, newspapers, departmental prefects, and French government ministers. Uh, in the words of Donald Reed, uh, Havas, in short, was the innovator who first organized the wide collection and sale of news as a marketable commodity. Uh, initially, he used pigeons to get daily information from London and Brussels, but he also had access to the government-controlled telegraph system in France uh, five years before it was uh, made available to the public. The second wave of collaboration was made possible by the development of the telephone. And here I'm going to give some examples that are sort of America-centric. I apologize for that, but I'm sure the, uh, the technology uh, developed in much the same way here. American Telephone and Telegraph used a radio station in New York, WEAF, as a, manufact as a laboratory, rather, for its manufacturing and supply outlet. Western Electric. Uh, the Bell system, AT&T's telephone utility, was developing technology to transmit voice and music program over short and long distances. So WEAF, just to make a long story short, uh, linked with two stations, one in Providence, Rhode Island, and one in Washington, D.C., in a sort of ad hoc network. RCA, the Radio Corporation of America, tried its own link up using telegraph lines, but the quality of marginal was marginal. Eventually, AT&T decided to concentrate on telephones and sold WEAF to uh, RCA, along with the right to lease its lines for network transmissions. In 1926, RCA announced the creation of the National Broadcast Company. Content was needed to develop this technology, so news and entertainment grow, programming grew. Uh, the programming was produced in the population centers of New York and Los Angeles, and a new culture of collaboration grew involving the companies that produced the content and the affiliated stations, which were linked together in a sort of confederation. The, th the uh, oh, and that's a, a map of, uh, what may have been the, uh, the first uh, television network in the US. The third wave of collaboration uh, began with satellite broadcasting, which hit its stride in the US in uh, the 1980s. The satellite made possible the cable networks and the possible of niche broadcasting or niche casting. It also made possible the 24-hour uh, news network. And it also made possible because of the volume of news, CNN 
created the concept of the non-market exclusive affiliate, which meant that two affiliates in the, or more in the same market could use the same content. And again, this was because of the volume of news that was coming out. The distinguishing factor of these three waves were that they were all professional cultures of collaboration. The telegraph spawned the wires. So, oh, there's the, uh, uh, the launch of uh, cable news. The uh, telegraph spawned the wire service. Uh, the telephone sp spawned the uh, television network. And of course, uh, then came cable. The fourth wave, I would argue, differs from these three models because of the rise of the internet, the World Wide Web, mobile technology, and electronic test, text, spawning a culture of collaboration that involves the consumer as well as the producer. The task we all face is figuring out the business model that fits this latest culture of collaboration. And that's a difficult question, as anybody who's in journalism school or or in the media right now knows. One starting point may be to go back to the, the whole idea of the country store or the village square as a place where the community gathers for information. Uh, if you remember the old model, before the Industrial Revolution, basically newspapers would come out, people would gather at these central gathering points and, and trade news, and it was a very community-oriented uh, process. I would argue that the uh, concept of a news organization as a rallying point, the town square, is almost as old as movable type and that we got away from that in the Industrial Revolution when it created the need for a more impersonal mass newspaper to carry news of commodity prices or other information uh, within the port cities uh, that, sub that uh, dealt with all the commodities and to the farms that actually supplied the, uh, the uh, process. The community model works on a number of different levels. Uh, it works on the, uh, on the local level. That's almost as old as, uh, as journalism itself. And it works on the global level. Witness how the world came together when there was uh, an earthquake, a devastating earthquake in one of the planet's most vulnerable uh, nations, Haiti. Uh, the courageous amateur videographers of Iran, Syria, and other nations in the throes of change also became part of the community, uh, as, we, as we've been talking about here today. So what about the bottom line? Well, some news organizations have become gated communities. Uh, I've been talking about this uh, uh, earlier today with, with a couple of people. The New York Times and the Wall Street Journal have partial paywalls. The Los Angeles Times, the newspaper where, where I live, uh, also has, uh, has started one. And uh, it's just one of the, the revenue ideas that have come up. So what are some other possible revenue ideas? Well, I'm not a marketing expert, and I'm not going to go into that in, de in detail or, or even propose things in detail. But Google came up with the idea of circles. It, with its Google Plus service. The idea of not, not just having social media, but having specific circles where people could, uh, could congregate. I wonder if there's a way for, say, newspapers and websites to do this, have, have increasingly specialized circles where people could pay to get in if they want more specialized information and leave kind of the generalized information at the periphery. Another possibility is to, uh, to offer, at, again, within these circles, to offer uh, deep discounts and, and possibly uh, uh, you know, offers that, that can only uh, come in those, uh, those areas. Now, by this, I'm not suggesting uh, at all a blurring of the line between sales and news. That's uh, as offensive to me as I'm sure it is to, uh, to everybody else. But, what I'm talking about here is like for years, the classified ad was a hook to get people to uh, buy the newspaper. There's no reason why we can't find a 21st century anal uh, uh, analogy to that. The idea of communicating as a community has been embraced by the so-called millennial generation, uh, the generation born roughly after 1981. 
if you subscribe to uh, generational theory, and I, I would highly recommend this, uh, this book by uh, Morley Winter, Winograd, uh, you know that the millennial generation is a civic generation. Members are optimistic. They believe in institutions and community service, and they're constantly connected. They function as a community. And who are their heroes? Well, this is, uh, they took a survey in the US and they found that 63% of the young men surveyed said they would choose to be stuck in an elevator with John Stewart, who's a comedian. Uh, if you're not uh, familiar with him, he's a comedian who hosts a uh, daily show that's it's very topical. It deals with news topics. But he's not a journalist. He's a, he's a comedian. Uh, that 47% uh, or 63% uh, said they would choose to be stuck in an elevator with him compared to 15% who would choose Eli Manning or another athlete. Eli Manning's a uh, footballer over there. And 88% uh, said that humor was crucial to their self-definition. In a 2007 survey, uh, Stewart and Bill O'Reilly, a conservative commentator, were tied as the top pick for favorite journalists among people under 30. So why is this? Why is this sort of blurring of the line uh, occurring. There are a couple of possible reasons I would suggest. One is the pos possibility that you can get the basic just online, just by surfing the 24-hour news channels or, uh, or just, uh, just surfing the internet. You don't have to rely on an evening news program. Then you can look to somebody like Jon Stewart to put the news in an entertaining uh, perspective. Uh, the other possibility uh, I would again suggest is that the bits John Stewart does are shareable. Uh, people uh, can, you know, say, "Hey, did you see the way he covered this? Did you did you get a laugh out of this?" And they can share it. And they would do that more more possibly than they would with just a uh, regular presenter. That's not to suggest that uh, John Stewart should replace Wolf Blitzer, CNN, or any other anchor. The takeaway is that people today consume news not as an audience, but as a community. It's a virtual community, but a community nonetheless. I would suggest that the penultimate challenge of our time is to ensure that it, this is a community in which everyone can participate. Uh, globalization has its points, but it hasn't benefited everyone. Uh, Castells points out that uh, if you go from Wall Street, which is approximately at the bottom of this picture, uh, to the South Bronx, which is approximately at the top, you go from an area that's possibly one of the nerve centers of the global economy to an area that's totally marginalized. So how do we get everybody involved? Take a look at the Freedom House Index for some more depressing news. According to the report, Freedom in the World 2012, 43% of the world's population lived in countries designated as free in 2011. 22% lived in countries listed as partly free and 35% listed in countries described as not free. According to the report, Freedom of the Press 2011, 15% of the global population lived in countries in which coverage of political news was robust. And according to the report Freedom on the Net 2011, bloggers or internet users were arrested for content they posted online in 23 of the 37 countries assessed. India, a country I visited in uh, December, is a classic example. Uh, India is listed as a free country in freedom of the world, but it's only listed as partly free in freedom of the press and freedom on the net. Uh, while I was there, they were debating uh, a measure that would have uh, forced internet service providers and uh, other content providers to monitor their content and to leave out insulting content, whatever that is. So I, I bring this up because I suggest that India is an illustration of the fact that for those of us who cherish freedom of expression, one of the biggest challenges may be ambivalence rather than just outright repression. We need to end the repression and the ambivalence with a strong statement that guarantees the right of all to access information and to associate freely. 
Articles 19 and 20 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are good starting points. Article 19 states everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media regardless of frontiers. According to uh, Article 20, everyone has the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and association. No one may be compelled to belong to an association. These are worthwhile passages, but they were written in the age before, in the era before the internet and before global technologies. I would argue that possibly what we need is an amendment to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights an amendment that would prohibit governments, search engines, web hosting services, and internet service providers from filtering content or blocking the ability to associate. One problem in the current environment is governments aren't the only problem because these, the companies that are uh, providing search engines and providing the, the tools that freedom fighters and journalists around the world are using are so ubiquitous that their policies, their worldwide policies, or their in-country policies can have an amazing effect. And sometimes, sometimes they're, uh, it's irrespective of the, uh, the country that's, uh, that they're located in. So I would suggest this is one possibility. Everyone has the right of access to the internet, the right of freedom of expression in any medium, and the right of peaceful assembly and association regardless of frontiers. No law or policy shall be enacted by any entity that abridges those rights. In the 21st century, information is the most valuable commerce of all. Anyone who tries to suppress information is guilty of basically restraining free trade. It's a form of commerce. Cyberspace is unprecedented. It is both the, the Royal Library of Alexandria and the Village Square. To be isolated from it is to be excluded from the human community. In that community, the news is no longer what I say it is. It is what we say it is, all of us. Let's resolve to protect it. Thank you very much. Does anybody have a spontaneous uh, reaction of any kind? Yes, sir. I, I, you know, I agree with what you're getting at, but I have a real problem the way you pitch everything as being part of the financial uh, situation. I think that amendment is important. You know, by the way, you don't amend the something that was brought up in '48. It's not like the American Constitution. But getting that through, if you could get it through, I think stands not about finances, not about economic models. It stands for rights of people. And I, I just wanted to point that out because your conclusions may be right, but some of these bases are what gets us into a lot of trouble. It gets us into trouble with, for example, these major corporations that had such a control over the internet, gets us into trouble, as we heard earlier this afternoon, when a car company, or in Canada, where I live, where the biggest phone company also owns the major commercial television network, and, the, and another one in, in Quebec, in French Canada, they own the newspapers, and they own the, the cable networks, and they own everything, and they're, and they're cross ownerships. So I think we have to take a step back and get out of worrying about the finances of it all and stand up here for the rights of the individuals to freedom. And that's what I think I, I'd like to see us pitch this as, if this is going to be some sort of campaign. Uh, if I could just respond to that for a minute. I completely agree with you. And part of the, part of the uh, confusion may be a result of the fact that basically I was trying to, to do two different things here. Uh, I would argue that, uh, that financial news was a driver of the, the business historically uh, in terms of like the, the development of Reuters, but I didn't mean to draw a link 
between between the finances and the the, the whole idea of uh, going on the record as as supporting say the uh, free access to the internet and uh, free and unfettered uh, uh, speech all over the world. I totally agree with you that uh, it should be divorced completely from the finances. The other part was just, just background. And, uh, on the face of it, your language would override national laws that protect people from defamation and from invasion of privacy. Do I read that correctly? Uh, not necessarily. I think it can work in, in concert with that. See, defamation, the, the problem is defamation is such a, uh, such a, a subjective term. There, to my mind, and uh, you know, tell me if you disagree, there, there's legitimate defamation you know, where, where you're actually embarrassing somebody who's not in the public eye and who's entitled to a certain amount of privacy or, or you say something about somebody that's just absolutely wrong. Then there's this sort of uh, contrived defamation of character where, say, a, uh, a country says, well, you can't draw a caricature of the king because that insults the king. You know, th that's the kind of defamation that, that I would argue is, uh, uh, is sort of spurious. You know, so, so I think it depends on the country and the context uh, as to how you define that. Should it override legitimate laws uh, governing defamation of character? I don't think so. People deserve that, that sort of protection. They deserve their privacy and they deserve, you know, not to be libeled or slandered. But it's, it's a measuring process. How do we, uh, uh, if you take that logically, how, how do you uh, assess a law that, you know, like I said, the, the king of whatever country, if you uh, draw a caricature of the uh, of the king in some embarrassing situation or some satirical point is that defamation uh, in the u s uh, the courts have made a distinction between public figures and private figures in general uh, to prove defamation of a public figure you have to uh, uh, you have to really th there has to be some actual damage uh, serious damage done because the presumption is if it's a public figure that figure should be able to take whatever criticism is is directed some very important issues would anybody like to follow up on that yeah we've got one question at the back my name is Marcel uh, I'll just a independent question not a follow-up but uh you spoke a lot about community uh -huh. and i think that like with the rise of uh, you know, new technology and stuff, so say an iPod, that people have tended to um, take themselves out of this community by only listening to the music they want, and now with the rise of uh, internet streaming of video, that they can only watch the shows that they want to watch. Um, and I think that your, what your suggestion of being able to buy uh, specific newspapers on only topics you want to listen to might uh, I just wonder what your thoughts were on how that could maybe negatively impact on a community it could uh, I mean part of the uh, it's sort of part of the process of the the decline of of mass culture and uh, I mean I asked my uh, when I was grow just to give an example when I was growing up uh, we listened to certain uh, uh, music was a big deal and we listened to certain radio stations, and that's where we got our our music, and uh, and that's where and that was sort of mass entertainment. And I'm constantly asking my daughter. I said, "How do you become aware of new music? Because she doesn't, she doesn't, she's not addicted to a radio station, or she doesn't listen to that, and she gets all of it from these sort of aggregations, or or, or these very loose ad hoc." Uh, I don't know, friendship structures or whatever, I still don't completely understand the process. I think that's an excellent point. At the, at, at the same time, we're becoming a little more isolated because of uh, things like the, uh, the iPod and stuff like that. But we're also more connected virtually. And uh, I walked through my uh, college campus, the University of Southern California, and the, the most common uh, 
sight I see is people looking down and they're texting and the thumbs are going a mile a minute. And, you know, th this is somebody who's connected. And I, 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 I'm also, I'm taking courses at USC. And I also watch people who are, uh, who are on, the, on their laptops, and I know they're, they're IMing during class, and they're going back and forth. And it, it's sort of, and you aggregate all this, and it's sort of this virtual community. But you're right, they're also, uh, it also has an isolating effect. So it's a, it's a very complex phenomenon. No easy answers. Um, yeah, I find this amendment very interesting, but just one note on the on the word internet, because uh, I think what you're proposing here is only uh, half of what you actually want to propose. Um, because for good reason, the, the laws in general are tech neutral, and the internet is the technology, so you would have to define the internet, because what we're seeing at the moment is many internets. We see an internet in Iran that is totally different from the internet that we have in Germany or in America. And actually, at the moment, there is a fierce fight going on between uh, to nationalize the internet, between companies, between responsibilities. So I think it's also necessary to define what kind of internet do we mean and um, how can we protect that internet that, that we all mean if we talk about freedom of expression, which is a very specific internet. I agree. Uh, that's, that's why diplomats make big money. Uh, it's the, uh, um, uh, you know, getting those nuances down, you're absolutely correct. And, and, and the... Uh, the technology is going to evolve even further. Who knows what we'll see 30 years down the, down the line. The internet itself may be outmoded, you know, may be, be replaced, replaced by some other virtual community. I'm suggesting this just as a, as a starting point. Um. We're talking about the internet and how everybody's getting networked. I haven't really heard much about how that's bad for us. I mean, I've gone to restaurants before and waited in line for a table, and there's an entire family on a cell phone, not even talking to each other, but rather talking to somebody else. Or like <laughs> at home, when people are eating their food, they're just watching around television, not even communicating with each other. They're communicating more networkly rather than in person. Yeah. So how is that changing our culture or our society, for the better or for worse? <sighs> It's hard to say. Uh, I guess the, the question I would pose in response to that is who are they communicating, who are they communicating with? Uh, you know, are they, it's, it could be anyone. Are they communicating with another family member? Are they, uh, uh, are they trying to get information uh, about somebody, uh, to use the restaurant analogy, or they, uh, is there a straggler who hasn't shown up for the, uh, for the dinner, and that are they trying to get information for, for that? Uh, again, I, I, I think it's uh, these virtual communities are very can be one, at one of the same in the same time very isolating, and and very uh, connecting. Uh, I think it's Malcolm Gladwell who, who draws a distinction between weak ties and strong ties, and uh, he uh, he argues basically that you need strong ties to get to get a movement, that the, the uh, that online communities are great for creating weak ties, but you need that sort of in-person uh, contact to develop strong ties, and I think that's a little what you're talking about. Are we in danger of uh, of losing the strong ties? I don't think we are. I, I think it's just a different method of communicating, and I think people still value face-to-face -face contact more than anything else. It's just uh, the internet and uh, uh, mobile technologies create another layer above that to supplement that. At least I would hope so. Um, I got the microphone. <laughs> then he's next. Um, you know, you said a couple of things that st struck a nerve. For me, this is just a variation on a the theme. I'm from Detroit. Uh -huh. And right across the river is Windsor, Canada. And in the 50s, when I was a young boy growing up, uh, CKLW used to broadcast films. Most of those films, uh, we all re recognize that Canada, Canada was a, is a member of the Commonwealth, were British films. It was one of the first times I saw uh, interracial couples, some nudity. Well, the 
government, United States government, and the local government in Detroit were contemplating blocking the signal because they did not want, uh, you know, Americans, some people say Americans are prudish or whatever, but there was a certain attitude or a certain image that was being projected by these films that didn't uh, necessarily coincide with uh, what America was about at that particular time and to some extent till t still today. So we do have instances of censorship, you know, which apply, which apply then and uh, which apply now. On the question of uh, radios and how people uh, get their music, <laughs> there were stations that didn't play black music then. Well, you know it and I know it. And what does that mean? You know, so this question, I think, there again, I said it once, I'll say it again. We have to look at this in the historical con context so it doesn't become so, an aberration. It is not an aberration. I'm not saying you're suggesting that. Right. But it is not an aberration. It has happened since Marconi, since we had the ability to electronically project a message. There have been people trying to either promote uh, that message or thwart it. That, that's true. Uh, it's something, it, it's sort of like what I was talking about uh, earlier, that ambivalence uh, is, the, uh, is as much a, um, you know, an opponent of this as, as outright repression. Uh, even in traditionally, uh, in, in showcased free societies, there have been instances like the, the thing you're talking about. Somebody, it, it always happens when somebody thinks that somebody is going to take offense or what, when, when they think that it's going to be a, uh, for lack of a better term, to, to use a Star Wars analogy, a disturbance in the force. And, uh, and you know, to a certain extent, I think you just have to let the, you have to trust the audience or, or trust the, the people who are going to receive it. Uh, to to be good judges of whether they're going to accept it or reject it. So, uh, I, I think in all countries th this is a, this is a concern. Maybe uh, people prefer, or will prefer face to face contact in the future, just for two things: one flirting and the other one for sex. Uh, who knows? <laughs> anyway, uh, the question I really want to ask you is: uh, you talked about the Journal and the Times being gated communities, and then talked about the kind of uh, maybe little circles of little specialist bits, you know, like, for example, golf. You know, you could just read, get stories about golf or something like that. Um, as an American, do you think that the, um, where at newspapers, per se, are really under severe threat, how long do you give it for the New York Times and or the Journal to appear as in their current printed form? I don't... That's a difficult question. I, I would, uh, I always hesitate to uh, uh, pronounce an epitaph for, for any organization. Uh, uh, going, if you go back years and years, when television first uh, came into its own, uh, so many people predicted the death of radio. I mean, because radio was, I mean, buffered. Uh, uh, specialized programming in evening, uh, you know, evening entertainment programming, and basically radio was then what television became thereafter. And a lot of people said, "Well, this is going to be the end of radio. Radio is just going to going to take a hike." And then all of a sudden, music became the mainstay of radio. So I could sit here and say, "Well, you know, I'll, I give the." The New York Times of just a few years or something like that, I would probably be wrong because I'm an optimist. I have a feeling that somebody is going to come up with a solution or there, there's going to be, uh, we're all going to figure out a new way of financing it because on the one, and it's a difficult thing because on the one hand we want information, I think we want information to be free and, and the whole idea that there's such a, a wealth of information out there is a good thing. But on the other hand, the people who work in the news have to be paid. I know I, I certainly would like to be paid. And uh, so how, you know, how do you figure that out? Um, I was just throwing out a couple of kind of starter ideas, but uh, I certainly don't have any of the answers. 
I'd like a, a, one spontaneous answer to you, for, uh, Jerry, from a question from me, which brings together one or two items. Uh, the, the sociologists would talk about whether people are atomized or collective, and you've mentioned, uh, I wrote down several um, uh, phrases that you used. You said a community of the whole. You talked about community service. You said we are still a community. You t said people can congregate. You talked about a rallying point. And it's interesting, earlier today, we talked about uh, cultural diplomacy in Syria. And one or two people said, why are we talking about cultural diplomacy in Syria? It just doesn't fit in the context. And I'm hearing you to use all these phrases uh, about the US at this point in time, mm -hmm. which in a political and social sense is a disturbingly divided society, as though you've got two separate communities drawing on two totally separate worlds of news sources. How does all that fit together? Well. One answer I would give, going back to that book I, I mentioned, the, uh, the Millennial Momentum, uh, one possible answer, and I don't, I don't know if this is, this is uh, the definitive answer, but uh, uh, the U.S. Congress, for example, which is extremely divided, as you mentioned, and uh, has an approval rating of, I think, in the single digits somewhere. I mean, it's just at its absolute nadir. Uh, the U.S. Congress is made up primarily of baby boomers who were, if you follow uh, generational theory, they, they were an idealist generation. And ideology is very important to them. The millennial generation coming up is more about, again, if you follow generational theory, and there's some critiques of it, but according to that theory, the millennial generation is more about pragmatic solutions. And about believing in institutions and rather than wrecking the institutions and starting over they want to reform the institutions so if you follow that train of logic maybe just with the the passing of the baton to a new generation maybe all that will go away and uh, at more of a community atmosphere will develop i i'm sort of an optimist for that i think we're just going through a phase it may not be the definitive explanation, but it's certainly an interesting observation. Jerry, thank you for that. Thank you. We're going to stay in the uh, US now. Derek is up next, uh, just a minute away.